الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم viewers of Imam Hussein TV welcome to tonight's live program my name is Muhammad Ali tonight's program we're going to be looking at the auspicious wiladat of Imam Ali al rida alayhi salam the Imam has many titles as all other Imams do to name a few he is known as Sabir al radi Wafi, Abul Hassan, Wali, but most popularly, Al Rida. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was content with him and is content with him and is satisfied with the Holy Imam. Before I introduce my guest, I will just mention a couple of things about the uh, dynamic topic tonight. Inshallah, we'll be looking at the social dimensions of Walaya through Imam Ali Rida alayhi salam. I'm honored to be on tonight's live show representing Imam Hussein TV. Our chief guest tonight, or our guest tonight, just to mention a few accolades about him, he is a director, a professor, world renowned Majalis reciter, author of books, inspiring personality to young and old. He is Dr. Sayyid Amar Nakshwani. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam. And welcome to you as well. Welcome. Thank you. Shukran. We're so happy to have you as Thank part you. of our shukran. team. Shukran. Shukran. I'm Thank sure you. the cameraman agrees. Yes. Great addition and uh, congratulations uh, to all the viewers out yes, there. Yes, absolutely. Yep. You know, uh, Wilad, uh, Mubarak to all the viewers around the world, the Tashayu followers of Hawli Ahl al Bayt, alayhim as salam. If we kick off this uh, live program tonight, hopefully, inshallah, we'll be discussing the life of the Holy Imam, but also we can maybe take some lessons from the life, apply that to the social way we live today. Inshallah. And also really take lessons in terms of what Walaya is and how that relates to each Imam, but predominantly in this uh, live program to Imam Ali Rada alayhi salam. So without further ado, um, he lived for 55 years, from my understanding. Uh, 35 years were simultaneously spent with his father, and he spent a fair degree of his time in Medina, but then he emigrated as well. Now, all the Imams have special titles, as we all know. Amir al Mu'mineen Ali Ibn Ali Islam has numerous titles. Imam Hassan Ali Islam has numerous titles. What is specific to the term or the name? or laqab as it were, al rida Yeah, it's very interesting when you're looking at the Imams of Ahlul Bayt salam, when you hear, for example, Baqir or Sadiq or Kadhim or Rida or Jawad, many people assume that that's their name. Mm. So you'll find that in many of our communities, there'll be people who'll be saying, we're going to the Wilada of Imam al-Baqir. That's right. Or of that's Imam right. al-Sadiq. Many will not say I'm going to the wilada of Imam Muhammad bin Ali or Imam Ja'far bin Muhammad. They'll say I'm going True. to Imam al-Baqir or Imam al-Sadiq because you find that within our communities many people do not realize that these are titles that were given to them. Absolutely. Specific ethical traits as well. I think when you're looking at for example Imams number 5 to 10 especially um, or Imams number 4 to 10, they've all got these ethical traits related to their names. Zayn al-Abideen, al-Baqir, al-Sadiq, al-Kadhim, al-Rida, al-Jawad, al-Hadi. And so when you're looking at these titles, one is talking about, for example, an adornment when it comes to worship. Yes. Another yes. is the one who... Uh, splits knowledge or goes to the very root of knowledge. Absolutely. But even if you have knowledge, you have to be truthful with it. Of course. But then being truthful with knowledge sometimes results in you having to restrain yourself in moments of hardship. Of course. What I'm doing really is when I'm going from Imam Zain al-Abdi alayhi salam, I'm going through each title. You're going through a person who's a worshipper. Worship requires ilm. Baqir al ulum but yes. that ilm requires truthfulness, yes. sadiq. But that sidq can sometimes be tested. Of course. Where you're going to have to restrain your anger, anger. in times of grief, yeah, al kavam Yes. But when you do restrain your anger in times of grief, it shows that you are pleased with whatever situation Allah puts in front of you. Subhanallah. And whatever trial Allah puts in front of you. 
when we're talking of the title al-Rida, there are certain spiritual levels which the Muslim seeks to attain in their life. Okay. And there are certain stages and certain steps that you have to uh, traverse right. in the spiritual path. And of them is reaching a level where you are pleased with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has willed this to happen, then you are pleased with the will of Allah. Mm. You recognize that others around you are like, why do you accept this? Aren't you angry? And you're like, Arradi bil qadari wal qada. That's why sometimes you'll hear in the ziyara, Assalamu alayka ya mawlai wa ibn mawlai. Assalamu alayka ya gharib al ghuraba wa anis al fuqara. Yes. Shams al shumus wa anis al nufus. Al madfoon bi ardi tus. Arradi bil qadari wal qada. He is someone who has accepted the will of Allah. What Allah has predestined, He has accepted. He's accepted. Because it's not easy living the life that Imam al Radha alayhi salam lived. All of us today celebrate the achievements of Imam al Radha alayhi salam. But many of us do not appreciate how many difficulties Imam al Radha alayhi salam went through in his life. Sure. I'm still trying to wonder <coughs> why the camera is below my feet, but anyway. When we look at Imam al Radha alayhi salam, we're seeing Imam al Radha alayhi salam and we're seeing that from the, from the very beginning of the life of Imam al Radha alayhi salam, there are trials that he faces with his father, Imam Musa al Kadhim. Imam Musa al Kadhim is spending life in prison, prison over a 20 year period yeah. from one prison to another prison he's moved. It's not 20 consecutive years. Right. Rather, okay. from one prison to another prison he's moved. How difficult is it for the son to see his father go through those difficulties? Of course. He but he accepts, accepts the will of Allah. Then he has to migrate, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And the Ahlul Bayt, salam, they love the land of Medina. For them, Medina is their heaven. Right. For them to have to leave that land is extremely difficult. But he accepts it's the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I have to leave that land. And so be it. So be it. Yeah. Then he has to accept difficult political circumstances at that time. So when we're coming to this title, and you know this title, there's a debate. Who gave him that title, al -Rida. Yes. One opinion was that al Ma'moon was the one who gave him the title. Right. But the Sheikh al-Saduq says, no, okay. this title is a title that was given to him uh, from the Ahlul Bayt, alayhim as sure. you know? yes. So you'll find that when we look at the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, looking at their titles are also lessons for what we should aspire mm -hmm. spiritually to become a reflection of. Of course, of course. Because there are certain things that are going to happen in our life. Can we really say, God, if you've decided that this is what I'm going to have to go through, then I am pleased with your will. Yes, yes. Many of us, there are some who may have a, a moment where they begin to doubt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are others who may turn around and say, why me? Sure. I'm such a wonderful human being. Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala testing Tessie. me in this way? You know, so that title is one not just for us to say his name, Okay. But also for us to wonder, well, how can we encompass that in our lives? And also, if I can add, um, are, is it true that these titles are actually roots, root words from the names of Allah? Yeah, you'll find, for example, if you're looking at, um, uh, let's say, uh, Imam al-Jawad's name. Mm, the generous. Yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you want to see ultimate generosity, um, there is none like uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, none can come near that. Jawad. But if you're going to see a bit of that, you'll see it in, in the character of Imam al-Jawad, alayhi salam. Likewise, at the same time, um, we are all looking for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be pleased with us and for us to be pleased with what Allah has promised us. Yeah. Okay? Yes. Hence you find whether in you know in some schools of Islam, next to the names of renowned personalities, you'll always hear Radi Allah an. Of course, yes. Or, for example, the idea in the Quran, رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عنه. Allah is pleased with them, and they are pleased with Allah. Not they are pleased with Allah. They are pleased with what Allah has brought forth. Right. That's the level. So when today you hear in some schools of Islam, they'll say, for example, the following companions, Ammar bin Yasser رضي الله عنه. Abu Dhar al-Ghafari رضي الله عنه. Abdullah bin Mas'ud رضي الله عنه. 
all of us want to attain that level where we could say that Allah is pleased with us. And we can ascend. And we can ascend and say that we are pleased with what Allah has put forward in front of us. Right. Yeah. I mean, just to uh, go back to your point in terms of the holy Ahlul Bayt, you mentioned that uh, Mahmoud Rashid Rashid uh, named him, um, according to one riwayat possibly, yeah. uh, Al-Wida. There's one that I came across. According to his son, Imam Muhammad Taqi, the glorious and the mighty Lord named him Rida because Allah was pleased with him in the heavens. Correct. And the Prophet of Allah and the Imams of Guidance were pleased with him on earth. Also his friends and relatives, even his enemies, which is quite unique actually. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, just to actually focus on that point. Even yeah. his enemies conceded that he was al rida you know, the, the, the one who is content. Um, just well, Imam al-Rada is living, for example, at the time of, you know, renowned scholars like Ahmed bin Hanbal. Yes, yeah. Yeah. of the, you know, who uh, posthumously the school known as the Hanbali school is named after and and they all revere him, you know, th that this person who has got such a following in, in the uh, Ahlul Sunnah world today would talk of his reverence for Imam al Rada alayhi salam. Sure. Other scholars would revere him. In Medina, it was a great time for him right. because people would flock to his lessons from many different theological of or course. legal backgrounds. Right. Yeah. Um, what isn't commonly referred to is the point, the, the dear mothers of the Imams. Yeah. So, on this, on this point, can you per perhaps just allude to who the Blessed Imam's mother was? Yeah, uh, Imam al Rada alayhi salam, there are different narrations right. which are mentioned. Okay. And sometimes you hear different names. Okay. Sometimes the ladies of Al Muhammad, you know, different names were given. But you find that Imam Al Kazim alayhi salam, um, in his own lifetime, a narration is mentioned about uh, a lady who he marries. Right. Who was a lady who his mother, Hamida, wife of Imam Al Sadiq, felt was the best lady for him. Okay. And that lady, some mention her name as Najma. Right. Later, they changed that name to Tahira, the okay. pure, one. pure one. And you're going to be quite pure if you're going to give birth. Of course. You know, you're going to be the purest of the pure when you're giving birth to someone like Imam al Rada alayhi salam. Uh, and with many of the Imam's mothers or even wives from Imam al Sadiq onwards, you find there's an African origin there. Right. Yep. Okay. Okay. The. What exactly took place, perhaps, if you can possibly just explain, um, after the shahadat of Imam Jafar Sadiq -Salam, in terms of the Ummah? Was it revolting? Was it moving? After the shahadat of Imam Sadiq, Sadiq -Salam, well, leading up to Imam the Kabum. Yeah. Well, Imam al-Sadiq towards the end of his life, it was a particularly difficult period with Al-Mansur al-Dawaniqi and the Abbasid government have firmly established themselves. So it's not an easy period at all. And this can be seen by the fact that even in his will, he doesn't, you know, in the will, he doesn't just say, well, my successor is Musa al kadhim mm -hmm. Rather, he puts five different <coughs> names in the will. Right. Because Al-Mansur al-Dawaniqi has told the governor that I want you to make sure that you go towards the will of Imam al-Sadiq, see whose name is there and execute the one whose name is there. So Al-Mansur tells the governor to go and look at the will. Imam al-Sadiq, who, whose names did he put on the will? First name, he's put the name of um, Al-Mansur al dawaniqi Second name, that governor. Right. Third name, Musa al kadhim Fourth name, another son. Fifth name, Hamida. So when this governor looks at this will, he's thinking, hold on a minute. I'm meant to kill whoever's name's on that will. I see. The first name is the caliph who sent me, and the second name is my own. Yes, yes. That really goes to show you that at that time, there's a beginning of a period of taqiyya. Now, mm -hmm. sometimes there are people out there who will mock taqiyya or the usage of taqiyya. They'll say that you, the Shia, for example, are the people of... Yeah. I want to ask one question. Right. How did we reach a stage where we needed to do taqiyya? 
What type of Islam were we living under? For a group of people who Oppression. love Ahlul Bayt, السلام, they love the family of the Prophet, peace be upon him, why would we have to conceal our beliefs? If Islam is this open religion where everybody can give their thoughts and yeah. opinions, and many Muslims out there who in their defense of Islam say, why is there Islamophobia uh, against us? We are a religion of peace. Our history is not a history of peace. Yeah, sure. sure. Our history is a history of expansionism, mm -hmm. going towards other countries, and anyone who does not believe in our beliefs in some cases was pillaged. Yes. And our history was a history where the grandchildren of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family, the Talibiyin in particular, right. were being massacred. Yeah. In the time of Imam al kadhim therefore, in, around the time when Imam al-Radha is born, we're only talking a hundred and a bit years after the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family has died. There are people who cannot reveal their love of the Prophet Muhammad and his family unless they follow one particular theological current. And so, those who come and say, why are you performing taqiyya? It's because of a religion of Islam that had leaders who were massacring people who did not agree with their theology. Yes, yes. yes. I'm, I'm very sad when there, are, when there are people out there who are like, oh, you know what, they're trying their hardest to explain taqiyya, and that, you know, and people are telling them, you know what, you know, you Shia are all about doing taqiyya. Okay, I did do taqiyya. Mm. Yes, I did, because I was living under butchers. Yes. I was living under people who would put you in prison if you had a different opinion to them when it came to the Quran. Yeah, absolutely. A different opinion to them when it came to hadith. But you find that the Muslims try and hide this. Muslims try mm -hmm. and show that the first couple of hundred years of their religious, religion's history was this really uh, peaceful, uh, wonderful era. period, era, yeah. when really the grandsons of the man who bought the religion of Islam were living in dissimulation. Yeah. 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 Okay, I think we're going to be going into a short break soon, but so I'll get the signal soon. But um, just coming back to the point of walaya, divine guardianship, authority, love. Um, how did Imam Lida al-Islam reaffirm the Jafri fiqh? Was it just a continuation of the education system that his grandfather had left as a legacy to continue? Um, what was, were there, I'm sure, new chapters of knowledge that he brought to light? What exactly, how did it change? Obviously, each imam, um, you know, taught the ummah and revealed different paths, as it were, of knowledge to come nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how in this case for the Holy Eighth Imam did he do that to... Yeah, it's, it's a very funny period because... Yeah. <coughs> a period of oppression? A period of oppression, a period where you're also starting to translate literature right. from other empires, let's say okay. Greek, Persian, etc. Okay. A period which some historians want to go back to and say is a golden age. A period where Baghdad is flourishing intellectually. Mm. So if you put all of this together, there are moments and there are flashes where that knowledge inherited from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, is able to be disseminated in Medinian circles. Because before Imam is forced to go towards Khurasan, in Medina, he's able to elaborate on every area of knowledge, not just jurisprudence. Today, okay. when you look at the Islamic seminary, in many cases, the Islamic seminary is jurisprudence. Yeah. There's a focus on Arabic grammar. There's a focus on Quran, Tafsir. There's limited focus on morals, ethics, and history. Right. But from Imam al-Baqir till Imam al-Radha, it was normal for an Imam to elaborate on medicine. Okay. The Golden Medical Dissertation. Mm. We'll come to which, that later. Which on. I advise people to try and read. Right. That and Golden Medical Dissertation 
highlighted that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt weren't just Jewish jurists. Jews. Yes. Yeah. It is an insult to limit the Imams of Ahlul Bayt to simply being jurists, even though there isn't a single law which they're not able to provide you with the answer for. Because when you look at sciences like Usul al Fiqh, yeah. these um, this, these sciences become uh, developed and begin to evolve post-occultation mm -hmm. while the remnants may be seen in pre-occultation. But what you find is that pre-occultation, you've got an imam there. You want to ask an imam a question, the imam is right in front of you, you can ask him that question directly. Of course. But you can also ask the imam on astronomy, geometry, mm -hmm. mathematics. physics, mathematics, Imam Sadiq salam graduating people in chemistry and algebra and so on. Thousands. So Imam al-Rada alayhi salam continues this. Right. Where he continues to highlight that seeking knowledge from the cradle to the grave is not just to be limited to jurisprudence. You know, I, jurisprudence is a wonderful area to study. But we don't just want a conveyor belt of jurisprudence. No, no. We want people in the world of, if, if you're looking at, in my opinion, in the world today, I think we need more people who have mastered the arts, um, you know, go into the world of art, the world of, for example, music in the sense, I know sometimes people want black and white on the issue of music, yeah, where yeah. straight away, oh, you can't talk about music in that way, no. But rather looking at how we can implement something for a positive usage. Absolutely. In our films, in our media, and yeah, so yeah. on. So that's a major lesson to learn from the Imams, that the Imams did not want us to limit the religion of Islam to being this legalistic, very structured, to the extent of being pedantic way of life. Yes, law plays a major role. Of course. There's no country on this earth that is able to survive without a legal constitution. But there's an ethical treatise, there's a medical treatise, there's a, you know, cosmological discussions, mm. psychological discussions. Yes, yes. And I mean, that all emerges with the Essentially, Imam. one could say that you're seeking to be versatile and dynamic and evolving, as it were, with society. Yeah. You know, and not being, you know, just as you said, just being staying put to be able to just talk about matters of fact and so on and so forth. So absolutely, we, there's a, a growing need, I think. And I think maybe in this day and age, we need to portray that as well um, through lessons of the uh, Aima. Well, that's, uh, you know, I find it so beautiful with Imam yeah. al salam that Imam at one minute, he'll say something extremely spiritual. The next minute he'd have a fondness for, you know, for example, literature and poetry and praise of the Ahl al-Bayt alayhi salam so. You know, Da'b al-Bin Ali al-Khuza'i, the famous poet of Ahl al-Bayt alayhi salam flourishes in the time of Imam al-Rada alayhi salam and then you, you, you look at people like Ayyub bin Nuh, you know, Yunus bin Abd al-Rahman, and other, you know, Ali bin Mazhiyar, and people like this, renowned companions of the Imam, who are able to discuss so many, such a variety of areas. In some cases, you thought they were polymaths in, yes, the, in yes, their lives. Yes. Yeah. We'll come to the migration shortly, but just want to sort of bring, hopefully, the audience into some sort of, you know, analysis. So I'll just quickly just read a few lines. Still Harun was an antagonistic towards the Prophet's uh, descendants and persisted in, in maltreatment of most of them in Medina. Um, political wranglings took place in Baghdad between the two sons of Harun. His eldest son Amin, who had an Arab mother, had the support of the Arabs and most of the Abbasid elders, while the younger son Mamun had a Persian mother and was supported by the Persians. To console both factions, yep. Harun took a pledge from both his sons that after his death, Amin would rule the Arab part of the empire, while Mamun would rule the Persian side. When Harun died in far away Tus, the most northern town of his Persian empire, Mamun was with him and buried him there. Amin in Baghdad immediately proclaimed himself to be the caliph, as it were, of the whole empire and immediately disposed, deposed Mamun from the rulership of the Persian province. What, what happened exactly for the Imam to be, I wouldn't say forced, but to move or to do hijrah from Medina to Tus? What, what, why did he go? In terms of layman's terms, if we think about it, why was there a need for the holy Imam to move? 
I don't think any Imam of Ahlul Bayt wants to leave Medina. Right. If it was their choice, they'd never leave Medina. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib wanted to leave Medina. Why did he go to Kufa? It's because you know that, for example, the Umayyads were getting stronger and stronger in Syria. <laughs> More strategic to go to Kufa. Kufa. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, did he want to go to Medina? Or did he want to go to Kufa? If the people of Medina and the Caliphate at that time did not chase Imam al Hussein out in the sense that they were ready to behead him, he wouldn't leave Medina. Right. Likewise, Imam al Rada alayhi salam does not want to leave Medina. But what you pointed out brilliantly there was that 150 years after the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family had died, yeah. the leadership of the Muslim world, the caliphs of the Muslim world, weren't anymore the people of knowledge or the people of spirituality. Islam had now Flipped. evolved wonderfully into an um, Arab political tribalistic empire. Yeah. Begun after the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, had died. Where it was all about, let's go to Persia, let's conquer other lands. The Umayyads want to conquer parts of Africa and parts of Greece and so on. And really, the Arabs just wanted to go around plundering everywhere. Right. And I think it reached a stage where even amongst each other as brothers, they were ready to fight each other. Greed. And yeah, that, that certainly was involved. Envy was involved. Okay. Uh, and if one brother realized, you know what? On this chessboard, that's a particular move I want to make. Because if I bring that man to the Persian side, I'm going to get a lot of votes. I see. And you want to win the Aliyad support. Okay, okay. Now, what do you do? No, first, you say, I need to bring him here. There's a big Aliyad community here. But I'll also make sure that when I bring him, he doesn't travel through the Alid communities where he could raise a mutiny or have some support that could cause us a headache. So what he ends up doing is he ends up making the Imam not go through Kufa, but rather go through Basra. And if you go through the Basran route, right. you're going to have less of a headache than going through the Kufan, Kufa. which is a center for um, you know, for, for Shi'i um, identity at that time. And also then make a loud statement, when I die, this is my successor. I see. When he, he knows that these are political statements that are going to win him the votes that he needs. What I mean by votes is he's already got control of that area, but more supremacy, more power. And so Imam al-Rada alayhi salam faces a very difficult time and I'll tell you why it's difficult. Okay. Imam al Rada alayhi salam, already people were questioning why he has no kids. You know, sometimes there may be listeners out there who are trying to have children, but they can't have. Maybe it's the beginning of their marriage, five years in, ten years in, it's not working out. There's still no kids. Imam al Rada alayhi salam, first child came when he was in his 40s. He had married young, but the first child came in his 40s. And there were people who were even questioning, are you really an imam? Because where's your successor? So he's going through that trial, going th had already gone through the trial of his father being in prison, Absolutely. going through a trial of many of his sisters having to leave Medina and Baghdad and areas like this because of oppression. Sometimes you hear there's a shrine of a sister of Imam al-Rada in Azerbaijan. Okay. Sometimes you hear there's a shrine in Afghanistan. There's a shrine, some say, even in indo pakistan Why? Yeah. Why are there shrines of the grandchildren of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family? Why do you find a shrine, for example, in Karachi? Yeah. Why do you yeah. find a rise of lovers of Ahlul Bayt in the indo pakistan continent? The Umayyad oppression and later Abbasid oppression mm -hmm. meant that many of these had to leave their lands. Now, when Imam al-Rada was forced to leave his land, he could relate to his great-grandfather, the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, who was forced to leave Mecca, Mecca. on the night of Hijrah. Yes. And that's the beauty about the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family. There isn't a single aspect of his life that you cannot take a lesson from. Right. Even when you're living in a country, and I think many of our parents experienced this, that they lived in countries 
where they had to migrate because of oppression. Oppression. Yeah. To preserve Absolutely. their identity. Yes. Absolutely. And nobody migrated like Ibrahim and Yusuf and Musa and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. All of them migrated to pastures new because of safeguarding their faith or safeguarding their belief or because they were compelled to. Yeah, sure. So when Imam al is compelled to go there, then comes the next question. How could you as an Imam be willing to work with, with a government that is known as being not that religious or known as being corrupt? Right. And I find this very interesting because there are many out there when I recently on my Facebook, I mm -hmm. had talked about uh, the Pakistan election and, uh, and Imran Khan and so on. And there were, you know, I was amazed to hear that there were people saying, um, you know, we don't really know about politics, uh, Sayyid Ammar. Yeah. You should stick to talking about uh, <laughs> religion. Now, the first point that we have to make is, a religion that does not have political discussion should not be called a religion. No. Because politics is a fundamental way of the gathering of society and the rights of people to air their views and the protection, hopefully, in a system of one's honor, uh, one's property, one's religion, and so on. Secondly, you're trying to teach me about politics. And you're trying to teach me that there is only one direction in politics. Have you seen some of the decisions Ahlul Bayt made politically? Mm. Have you seen some of the decisions that the Ahlul Bayt made where I sit here a thousand years later and I'm bewildered? But it's politics. Of course. But it's Ahlul Bayt. Yeah. You see, if a politician today makes that decision, you're like, oh, you know what? Double standards, 10 faced, 15 faced, 20. Faced. The yes. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family, makes a treaty with a group of people who have tortured his companions and have attacked the religion of Islam. Yeah. But he decides, you know what? A treaty with those people who have been terrorists for years may sometimes be the way forward. Wallah, I tell you. If some of our community members were living at his time, they would say, how could you support, how could you be yeah. willing to do or have discussions or sit politically with a group of people who are terrorists? So now we'll just go for a break. Uh, after the break, we'll Continue. probably, inshallah, have some questions. Viewers, do call after the break. The telephone number is 0203 515 So inshallah, we'll see you very shortly. <laughs> tonight's live show live program as it were where we are analyzing and discussing the social dimensions of walaya through imam Ali al islam so now just prior to the break we'll have some uh, calls shortly but let's just uh, revert back to the question if i may um we were talking and discussing about the political uh circumstances yeah yeah if you can maybe just continue yeah, I, I was saying I was saying that points. very clearly, yeah, yeah. Uh, very clearly that in the history of the Ahlul Bayt salam, there are different political lessons to be learned. Right? Can you do a treaty with people who were ex-terrorists? Yes, you can. The Hudaybiyah Treaty. Okay. Can you do treaties with people who have fought you, or in some cases are renowned hypocrites? Imam Al Hassan will tell you about of that. Course, can you, for example? Be involved in a government with someone with a track record. Or from a family of a track record of being anti-Shia. Can you take a position as their Good points. representative or their deputy? Because Imam al-Rada 
is asked this question. Where some of the Shia of that time are saying, how could you take this position? Nothing changes, by the way. Okay. Every yeah. single one in our community out there believes they know more about politics than anybody else. Yeah, yeah, sure. Whereas they don't know from the examples of the Ahlul Bayt, there are different nuances which are involved mm -hmm. in the political world. And one of them is this. They say to him, how could you take that position? He asked them, he said, I want to ask you a question. Who's greater, the prophet or his wasi? They said to him, prophet. He said, who's worse, the kafir or the mushrik? They said to him, mushrik. So what do you say about a prophet who served as economic minister under a mushrik? Which prophet? Yusuf. Yeah. Nabi Yusuf alayhi yes, salam. Yes, absolutely. Served as the economic or the treasurer or whatever you want to label it under the king of his time. Yeah. Today when I see our people straight away jumping on this, that how could you people support somebody who made the treaty or sat with or did and I'm not even going to go into Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib because yes. with Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib he was willing to help personalities who according to Shia belief had done so and so and so and so. Yes. yes. So with Imam al-Rada salam Al-Ma'moon had told the people that this is my representative. Imam al-Rada also on certain occasions wanted to make clear that this Al-Ma'moon, what he's telling everybody, he's not going to fulfill. Right. We have some questions yeah. coming in, and they're coming in um, quite th uh, thick and fast now. Um, so the first one is, why is Imam al rida al-Islam known as Slim al-Alim al alimain uh, It doesn't quite make sense to me. Um, does that resonate with you? Doesn't no? resonate with me at all. Okay. Um, Yusuf from Pakistan. How do I learn Islam from start to finish with side notes for both historical and spiritual? aspects well so the first source for us would be the Quran mm -hmm. that's the first source of knowledge for all of us anybody who is able to study the Quran study the reasons of the revelations of the verses of the Quran study the spiritual lessons within the verses of the Quran right not just the historical there are certain verses in the Quran which provide us with an understanding of how we spiritually grow there's that yeah. major concept so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the successful ones are the ones who can purify their soul. And part of that purification of the soul, there are many other verses in the Quran which describe to us how that the prophets of Allah, how they went through trials, how they overcame the trials, which supplications they would recite in overcoming the trials. So I would say that if you want to begin your journey in understanding Islamic history and spirituality, the Quran, no doubt, is the beginning. Mm -hmm. Then there are specific texts okay. which one can study for each of these. Right. You know, Ayun Akbar al Rada of Shaykh al Saduq is a phenomenal text if one wants to study the biography of Imam al Rada. Right. So if you want to see the history of the period of Imam al Rada, I would personally recommend that as the text for you to study. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, two more questions. Um, how can we read the teachings of Imam Jafar Sadiq Islam? Imam Sadiq Islam, his teachings can be found in a number of different sources. And different languages. Diff of course, different languages, no doubt. But first and foremost, we have uh, major textbooks of hadith, which have provided us with thousands of the legal, ethical, theological traditions of Imam al-Sadiq If you were to name, let's say, five or six of these canonical texts, okay. such as Al-Kafi of Shaykh Al-Kulayni, sure. or such as Man La Yahdarahu Al-Faqih of Shaykh Al-Saduq, which is more legally oriented traditions of Imam al-Sadiq, and Al-Tahdib and Al-Stabsar of Shaykh Al-Tusi, as well as later on reading works such as Wasa'il al-Shia, Mustadrak al-Wasa'il, as well as Bihar al-Anwar. These provide us with thousands of the traditions of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Now, someone might turn around and say, but I'm not an Arabic speaker. So how will I be able to study the life of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam if I don't speak the Arabic language? Okay. 
sometimes you find that there are wonderful books, biographies of Imam Sadiq that have been translated into English. Sheikh Al Mufid, may Allah bless his soul's famous work, Kitab Al Irshad, which is available in the English language, has a whole section on Imam Al Sadiq. You have, for example, uh, the renowned scholar mm -hmm. Baqir Sharif Al Qarashi yeah. has a biography of Imam Al Sadiq. Okay, do we have a, a caller online, a live caller? Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam, alaikum salam. Yes, please. Your question, please. Why is Imam Al-Rada called Alim Al-Alamin? Right, that is... Thank you. I haven't got a clue. No, okay, sorry, apologies, we do not have uh, the answer for that. There is a question from Canada. Alam Al-Alamin. Very interesting, could be applied to all 12 of them. Yeah, yep, sorry, go ahead. There is a question uh, that has come from uh, Canada. Um, personally, I think it needs to be addressed. Because if Islam claims to be a perfect religion, a perfect way of life, therefore it has to address certain issues which may be controversial, which may be, people may not like to hear. So I'm going to pose it. Yep, go ahead. And, uh, Salaam Alaikum, we recently learned that one of our family members is homosexual. Is there any advice that the Sayyid can give us on how we can behave with him? Do the Ahlul Bayt have a stance on this from Canada? Everyone uh, makes certain decisions related to their sexual life. Mm -hmm. And you're living in a country where people are free to choose uh, what way of life they want to take, whether it's theologically, whether it's ethically. Whether you're in Canada or you're in Britain, or you're in America, this way or this issue has to be dealt with either from a legal perspective or are we dealing with it from an ethical perspective? If we're dealing with this from a legal perspective, then the religion of Islam and its tenets prohibits mm -hmm. that homosexual way of life in the same way the Jewish religion prohibits. Yeah, absolutely. Ethically, I will not show rudeness or hate to someone because of their sexual orientation. That person, they have decided that their conscience feels that this is something which is acceptable and that they feel that this is something which is in accordance with their nature, their worldview. And if that is what they believe, then I am no one to come and compel them to change this. I can provide them with guidance that I believe yes. that my yes. religion provides and that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, was no different to, you know, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Moses spoke about it. Christ spoke about it. Muhammad spoke about it. So at the end of the day, the Abrahamic religions may prohibit such an act, but certainly I'm not going to come and attack somebody, mm -hmm. whether it's emotionally or physically. Now, that person, because of their sexual orientation, should they be kicked out of our mosques, for example? And the reality is no. That person can be more than welcome to come to the mosque. If they're coming to the mosque to worship God, it's none of my business, what I haven't seen in my own eyes. And you know, sometimes our people also make many rumors about people's lives. Yes, yes. But what I haven't seen in my own eyes, I'm not going to come and condemn somebody and tell them you cannot come to the house of God. Because that person may just simply come, sit with the rest of the crowd, um, pray with the rest of the crowd, eat with the rest of the crowd, and they go home. Yeah. They haven't spoken about their sexual you know, Preference. beliefs or preferences. Yeah. They're part of the congregation. Yes, if somebody, I think this is in any area, right. that if somebody's going to walk into the mosque and is going to start saying, well, this is the only way if you don't accept it, well, then there's going to be dissension within the mosque. Mm, mm. But if that person is another member of the community and they're trying to all find their way in life, then we should not be people who show hate towards different minorities. Right. There's another caller on the line. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Yes, brother, your um, question, please. Just say in My there. My question is, I'm a new Muslim to Islam. Right. And I want to learn more about Islam and our Imams. What is your advice? Alhamdulillah. 
Well, you certainly don't sound like a new Muslim. You sound like as fresh a Muslim as possible. But uh, maybe I got that wrong. Um, but say you are a new Muslim and you're, uh, you know, revert to the religion of Islam. Where's the be what's the best literature for you to read? Once again, such questions are very difficult to answer because where do you want to begin with? There are certain ethical works which are brilliant to read. But how well versed are you in terms of different ethical discussions? There are some historical works, some theological sure. works, some spiritual works. Yes, yes. It really, you can't just say, a person cannot just come and say, okay, I become a Muslim, what good books are there to read? A person has to be asking, well, there's a certain area I'm really interested in. Mm, or, the, or there's an area that I want to increase my knowledge in. Yeah, yeah. Now, from there, we can guide you, for example. Right. Right. So if we could be a bit more specific sure. with such a question, yeah. rather than just uh, you know, uh, a random uh, questioner just asking a question about question. If the sake. caller can elaborate or even perhaps email, uh, I'm sure uh, we can perhaps uh, give him the guidance. Um, we've only got about 15 minutes left, I think. So I'll quickly move on. Um, how was, um, when traveling to Qom, from Basra, yeah. or via Basra, as it were. Um, did the Holy Imam al Islam reinvigorate the Shia Tashayu followers uh, with points relating to Walaya centralized through the mourning rituals in respect and remembrance of Abab Dala Imam Hussein al Islam? Uh, we hear about this often, and you also alluded to the point that there was a, a significant degree of oppression whereby it led numerous followers, lovers of Ahl al-Bayt, to move. And there was m a mass exodus of uh, migration, as it were, from Iraq, Iran, to the Indian subcontinent, Africa. I have heard that um, he almost re-galvanized, re-energized the Tashay youth, specifically through uh, remembrance of Imam Hussein and through the remembrance of uh, Say the Zainab Islam. Yes, no doubt. Um, the city of Qom, which was a, a city of the followers of Ahl al Bayt um, from the Ash'ari tribe, okay. um, years before Imam al Rada salam, had come to Qom. But you're absolutely right. The footsteps of an Imam of Ahl al Bayt in any area, the energy of a, the presence of an Imam no doubt galvanizes the people of that mm. area. And the people of that area had felt for a certain period of their life that they had been severely oppressed. So when the Imam went there, the Imam began to organize majalis in honor of his grandfather, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. There is a real principle hadith which we can take from Imam, Imam al Rada alayhi salam. He talks to his <laughs> companion, uh, Ibn al Shabib. And he says to him, Yabn al Shabib, in Sarraka and Takuna Ma'ana fit Darajat al Ula min al Jinan Fahzun li Husnina, Wafrah li Farahina. He says, O oh, son of Shabib, if it gives you pleasure to be with us or you want to be with us in the highest levels of the heavens, then grief in our periods of grief and be happy in our periods of happiness. This is something that we have carried and has been the reason of the success of the lovers of Ahl al-Bayt wherever we go. That our love, allegiance, and taking on the wilaya mm -hmm. of Ahl al-Bayt, and not just the guardianship of Ahl al-Bayt, the wilaya that is amongst us as lovers of Ahl al-Bayt, where at times of the grief of Al Muhammad, we grieve. Yes, yes. And at times which remember the happiness of the days of Al Muhammad, we also yes, will yes. celebrate. Absolutely. This is unique to us, that you will not find a group of Muslims in the world who remember the dates of the deaths of the grandsons or the grandchildren of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, organize a lecture, give out food, shed tears on the days of the grief. Quite right. And on the days of the celebration, Quite organize right. a lecture, give out food, 
and smile amongst each other like the followers of Ahlul Bayt. Yes. Sometimes our people have not realized the secret in spirituality lies in commemorating and celebrating the lives of Ahlul Bayt. No it's doubt. a shame. No doubt. It's a shame that you can have the, let's say, wilada of Imam al-Rada alayhi salam a couple of days ago. And it's a shame when there are many people who don't know it's the wilada. Yeah. It's, it's a shame. It is. It's the same people will tell you all the matches in the World Cup. True. They'll say to you, this was the score, that was the score. That's right. The same people will tell you which films out. The same people will tell you economically or politically what's happening in the world. But then if you were to ask them, did you go to any mosque for example, on the 25th of Shawwal for the Shahada of Imam al Sadiq, Yabna Shabib. In Sarrakan Takuna Ma'ana, Fid Darajat al Ula min al Jinan, Fahzun li Huznina, Wafrah li Farahina. O son of Shabib, you want to reach the highest levels of Jannah? Be in a state of grief when remembering our times of grief. And celebrate, celebrate. When I say celebrate, listen, some of our mosques don't celebrate. Okay. Some of our mosques, it's serious, no smiling, <laughs> crying all the time. Okay, celebrate. celebrate. A wilada is a celebration. Absolutely. Get the poets out, yes. like the imam would get Dabal bin Ali al-Khuzai out. Have a good time. Mm. Enjoy yourself. Let the kids have prizes. Yeah, yeah. You know, let there be um, a growth in the camaraderie yes. amongst the people. Yeah, it has to be interactive. Honestly, there are some places you go there on a wilada of an imam, mm -hmm. you think you've gone to a funeral. Yeah. Very quickly, uh, say now we've just got a few minutes. So I just want to bring two points to your attention. Uh, if we can very quickly uh, elaborate on this. One is the great tragedy of Fakh. Mm. Okay. The other one is the dissertation of Imam Rudha. So if we can quickly talk about that. So the great tragedy of Fakh is actually a repetition of Karbala. It's an echo of the great martyr. Oh, Imam, Imam Rudha alayhi salam says, if Karbala hadn't happened, the greatest tragedy would be the tragedy of Fakh. Da'bil bin Ali al-Khaza'i alludes to this tragedy where in his famous poem, he talks about how the Ahl al-Bayt have graves in Kufa. Medina and in Fakh. In Fakh, this area which is outside of Medina, right. they butchered the grandchildren of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. The Abbasids ordered that the grandchildren of the Prophet Muhammad and his family are butchered. Imam al Rada alayhi salam, if I'm not mistaken, uh -huh. and I'm doing my history mathematics here, Imam al Rada alayhi salam would have been. Just hitting, if I'm not mistaken, he would have been just hitting. Oh, God. He must have been in his 20s at the time. Yeah. Yeah, must have been about 20. Must have been in his 20s or just hitting his 20s. And they caught the kids of Ahlul Bayt and they beheaded them. And I advise many of our listeners, type the incident of Fakh, F-A-K-H, and just look at how barbaric Islam the religion had to witness Muslims become. Right. Where you could gather kids, nothing surprised me. So we saw ISIS, we realized things like this yeah. happened. So that incident, the Ahlul Bayt did not let go of. Yeah. Yeah. And when Imam Rada Islam says, if it wasn't for the Barakah, if it wasn't, uh, Imam uh, Rada says, if it wasn't for the incident of Karbala, then the greatest tragedy would be the incident of Fakh. Right, yeah. okay. Um, if the producers can just uh, remind us how much time we have left. Yep. Uh, is that one minute, I believe, we may have? So um, the dissertation, I am. we probably won't have time to uh, discuss it. We have future show, maybe Monday <laughs> night, <laughs> Monday <laughs> night show. But we can obviously yeah. come back to this, uh, and we should do. We should. Um, but Hopefully so on Monday night we'll be back. So I think we have run out of time. So if, on behalf of Imam Hussein TV and from Syed Dr. Amar Nafwani, myself Muhammad Ali, I'd like to wish all of the Shaiya followers around the world Eid Mubarak on the Wiladat of Imam Rada alayhi salam. Inshallah, I look forward to seeing you again. Inshallah, we look forward to having Dr. Syed Amar again.
Selamat. Hey.